Good morning, everyone. Would you please stand and join us as we begin worshiping in song? Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. Baptist Church. It's good to see each and every one of you. Glad that you're here this morning. I pray that you are thankful for the opportunity you have to be here today. I want to draw your attention over to Hebrews chapter 4. We read this passage from time to time in our opening, and I, I really want us, as I read verses 12, 13, and 14, then for us to join in together on verses 15 and 16. They'll be underlined for you, and us read those two verses in unison. It says here, for the Word of God is living and active, and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. And now together, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. 
Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity we have today to worship you. We're thankful uh, to unite together, Father, to come into this fellowship with the express purpose of worshiping you. Father, we are so thankful that as this passage describes, we have a high priest, Jesus Christ, who knows all of our weaknesses, who with sympathy pains at our weaknesses, at our hurts, at our troubles. And Father, we are thankful that in all of that understanding, He intercedes on our behalf. Father, we're thankful that in all of this, those who have trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, we have the opportunity to come before Your throne to receive exactly what we need for this day, for this moment. Father, thank You for the truth and the the privilege, the grace and the mercy that's offered through this passage. And Father, we come to you today and we pray that as the first part of this passage calls that the word of God, that your word would truly pierce to our heart's level today. That Father, if there'd be anyone in here that's got sin residing, that it would pierce in, Father, and make that clear and obvious that through the power of your Spirit, Father, we would be convicted, that we would repent, that we would turn and submit ourselves back to you again. Father, I pray for those that may be here hurting with various health issues and uh, relationship problems, Lord, all that's going on, that you would just be so real today to them, that as we sing these songs, as we are reminded of who we are in Christ, Father, that help and that comfort and that peace would come. Lord, we pray that in all of this, truly, today, you would be honored and glorified with our words, with our thoughts, and with our actions. And Father, we ask all of this today in your precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. as I
to love, love, love your good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are. I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Your good, good father. It's who you are. this morning in Psalm 71 verse 19 it says for your righteousness O God reaches to the heavens you who have done great things O God who is like you the splendor of the
song. Man, I tell you. While you're turning in your Bibles over to Mark chapter 7, verses 31 through 37 this morning, we're going to round out Mark's uh, seventh chapter here. But what a song. And I don't, I mean, do you get as excited as I do on that last verse? When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation. Oh, and we, you know, we, we sit here and we praise him through these songs today. We're thankful that we were able to come just as we were, broken, empty, with nothing to bring to the table. We're so thankful that he is a good father who knows what we really need when we don't even know it ourselves. And we praise all these things, we sing all these things, but, but one day we'll be face to face to finally go, my God, how great you are, as we just fall at his feet for, I don't know, I don't know exactly how long an eon is, but maybe a two or three eons will do that. And then maybe we'll do something different at that point. But just for countless ages, we'll just be there Man. to worship Him. Man, what a, what a day that will be. I look forward to that day. Yeah. Long for that day. Until then, <laughs> we have work to do. Until that day comes, there is a message to proclaim. And what we find in our passage, hopefully you've gotten there. If you have your Bible, if not, there's some brand new Bibles in the pews. 
that you could open up there and read from. And if you just don't want to do that, it'll be on the screen in just a minute. But what we find here in our passage is an incredible story of healing today. And it's only recorded here in Mark's gospel. And it's got some profound application for us as believers today in 2020. What a remarkable year it's been so far. And it it could only get better, right? (laughs) But in this healing, with these implications, hopefully we will draw application for ourselves, for our own heart today. So I'm going to ask you early on here, we're going to stand and read the passage first off before we start introducing it. And then we'll get the context, we'll get the introduction, and we'll figure out what all is happening to then apply this message to our lives today. So if you would, join me as I read aloud Mark chapter 7, verses 31 through 37, as we consider the care and compassion of Jesus. It says, again, he went out from the region of Tyre, came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, within the region of Decapolis. They brought to him one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty, and they implored him to lay his hand on him. Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself and put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, he touched his tongue with the saliva. And looking up to heaven with a deep sigh, he said to him, Ephtha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was gone. It was removed, and he began speaking plainly. And he gave them orders not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. Verse 37 says, they were utterly astonished saying, he has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word today. Thank you for this incredible story. Father, the implications this story has on our lives today. And we pray that through your spirit, you would help us to apply this to our hearts and lives. And in the week we have to come, we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So you recall from last week, we looked there at the Syrophoenician woman. She comes to Jesus in uh, in the the area of tired Sidon, what we would call Phoenicia. And uh, she implores, that word's used a lot of people in deep need, right? Implore, to beg, to desperately ask for help. Because her little girl was cruelly tortured by a demon. Now, you remember just a few verses earlier than that, Jesus has been in Galilee for probably over a year now, and he's now uh, retreated away from Galilee to this Gentile area, right, to try to seclude a bit, to spend these these last bits of time teaching the disciples, because as we know, they're still a little dense. (laughs) They still don't get it. They still don't quite understand who he is, what he's come to do, and all that comes with the, the, the message that he's proclaiming. And yet, even as he enters into these Gentile territories, people know who he is. He's recognized. Well, verse 31 tells us that again, now Jesus is moving from Tyre down through to Sidon, and he's headed into Decapolis, 10 cities. That's what that means, Deca, Capolis, uh, 10 cities. So he enters into this 10-city region. Now, you recall also Mark wrote this with the intention of Roman readers. So they would have really appreciated a mention of Decapolis because Decapolis to Romans was like the Rome away from Rome. It was like, it was like the, the, the center bed, right? And we find through some archaeologist discoveries and uh, uh, time of study through that area that it was, these cities were a center for pagan worship, for Greek gods, statues and honors to these Greek gods like Zeus and Hermes and all the others. We studied them in school probably at some point. And so they would find all these statues. Imagine Jesus walking in to this 10 city region and seeing in honor of Zeus 
in honor of Hermes, in honor of Epaphrodite. Imagine what that must have felt like as the true God walked among statues of the false gods and all of these idol worshipers that would have been surrounding him at the time. Well, Jesus comes. And as we saw, as we've seen, and we we understand his primary focus on presenting the gospel message was to the Jewish people, right? To Israel. However, we saw from last week, we see this week, his willingness to minister to these Gentile areas gives us this preview of the truth that the gospel is and was all along intended for all nations to hear. Thank God for that. Every one of us in here should thank the Lord for that plan, or else we wouldn't be here today. We'd be out filling our Sunday with something else to do. And by the way, much lesser to do, right, than worshiping Him. Now, as they come into this land, they come into Decapolis, this would have been very close to the same region or area where Jesus had had told the legion to come out of the demon-possessed man. And you recall there in chapter 5, Jesus heals the man, and the guy says what? I want to go with you. Put me in the boat. I don't want to ever leave your side. This, whatever you're doing is incredible. I want to be a part of it. Jesus doesn't permit him in the boat. Instead, maybe you remember Jesus says, go back and tell everybody you know your story. What has happened here today? We're only an introduction, but there should be an application for each of us who are believers this morning. We have that same command. Go back and tell everybody you can find your story, what Jesus has done in your life. Now, this guy must have gone and done a pretty good job. Because as Jesus enters Decapolis, this region, we find there are just hordes of people coming out. And they're bringing the sick and the lame and the crippled for Jesus to heal. They're coming out to hear what Jesus has to say. Now hold your spot here, Mark, for just a minute. Flip back over to Matthew 15. We did this last week. We found some of that uh, uh, extra information. Matthew gives us a little more of it. Gives us a little more context before we find this miracle in Mark's gospel. Picking up there, Matthew uh, chapter 15, verse 29 it says, departing from there, so that's still Tyre, right? Headed through Side and down to the Sea of Galilee, Jesus went along by the Sea of Galilee, and having gone up on the mountain, he was sitting there. And notice verse 30, and large crowds came to him, bring with them those who were lame, crippled, blind, mute, and many others. And they laid him down on his feet, and he healed them. Gentile land, pagan worshipers, they have come to the true God. And I love what verse 31 says. Hopefully you're there. If not, listen close. So the crowd marveled as they saw the mute speak, the crippled restored, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing, listen, and they glorified the God of Israel. This gigantic crowd of Greek God worshipers now imagine, they've, they've tried to bring their lame to Zeus or whoever it is they're supposed to bring for blindness, right? I mean, how do you keep that straight? And they bring it. It doesn't do anything. Oh, okay, we didn't bring it right, so they bring it again. And they would, they would work themselves up into sometimes where they would self-mutilate, trying to appease this false god. We had a gentleman in our church here years ago. They moved away, but he used to be um, Hindu. And he talked about how they had 300 plus gods to appease on a daily basis. Can you imagine? The effort that that these people have put in trying to get their loved ones healed, their loved ones considered by their gods. And they've come to the one they've heard across the land, is able to do what none others can. And they're laying the sick and the ill at his feet, and he's healing them, Gentile people. 
And they've come to see the power they've heard Jesus has, to see it for themselves. And it says there in Matthew's account of it that they marveled. That word literally means they were awestruck. They weren't so concerned about that six-way tailgate that everybody's jaw drops in the commercial. When they saw (laughs) Jesus do it, they went, whoa. Can you imagine the scene? Awestruck, they marveled. And it sums up that they glorified the God of Israel. How amazing. The number of years that they had followed false gods and had never made them happy. And here, the true God, they didn't even have to make him happy. He poured himself out with care and compassion on these people. And they glorified him. Here in this 10 city region of pagan God worshipers, They begin to worship, finally, the one who should be worshipped. Now, you counter this to the Jewish leaders who heard the same message, who saw the same healings, and rather than worshipping Christ and standing awestruck by his deity and his power, what did they do? They attributed his, his power to the enemy. Can you you fathom this? Pagan people understood who Jesus was better than the religious who had studied him for centuries and should have been the ones on just the edge of their seats ready for him to be there. And they missed it. So we've got a little context. Flip back over to Mark. So we find a particular man that's been brought down to... Jesus' feet to be healed. And the story, this application that begins to come. So a couple of things I'm praying for as we go into this. That each of our hearts be open to the word of the Lord and the leading of the Spirit at this time. That we would search our hearts to see if we have this desire that we find from these friends and family to bring people to Jesus. Or that perhaps we would find this morning we ourselves need to come before Jesus. I would pray that today we examine our lives and see if bringing people to Christ is even a priority in your day-to-day activities, and that we would gain a greater picture through this story of the care and compassion that Jesus has on the lost and dying world around us. So let's dive in this morning. The first thing we find, there's two points. I put a few extra things in there for you, notes-wise, we'll pick those little Uh, statements up as we go, but the first thing we find is that Jesus hears our cries for help. Jesus hears our cries for help, and we should say amen to that. We're thankful for that, right? Verse 32, we get introduced. They brought to him, Jesus, one who was deaf and spoke with difficulty. This man cannot hear, and he can't speak very well. Now, it could have been that this... uh, deafness occurred at birth. He may have been born this way, or maybe it happened early on uh, with a disease or something in the area. Whatever the fact, people who can't hear, it's difficult to form proper words to make it sound correctly because you can't hear it. You imagine just for a second not being able to hear a single sound. Mom, dad, you never have heard your kids cry, laugh, uh, 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 talk. You've never heard music. You've never heard the words, I love you, I care about you. Just can you imagine? You never heard the thunder roll across the sky. Never heard the rain hit the tin roof. That's this guy's plight. And he can't speak well. But aren't you thankful for some friends and family? that cared enough to say, hey, well, we hear Jesus is in town, let's try, let's go. None of these other gods around this 10 city region have done a thing for him. Let's try Jesus, let's take him there. We've heard he's done it for others. Why couldn't he do it for our friend? Why couldn't he do it for our loved one? And they bring him and they lay him at Jesus' feet. Now something you need to realize, 
Most people with physical ailments like blind or deaf or mute, uh, lame, crippled, they were outcasts in society. They were the undesirables. In fact, rabbinical teaching of the day would classify this man as being mentally disabled. And he would have been just put off in a home somewhere. The reason being is he couldn't communicate, hear and communicate well enough for them to know what he actually knew and didn't know, so they would just think, well, he's mentally handicapped, so no need to try with him. He must not be very smart. He must not understand. And so oftentimes, the religious leaders, which no doubt we're not told they're right here, but I'm sure they're on the edge listening in. They wouldn't go into Gentile land, right, how good they are. But I'm sure they're listening in. I'm sure they have some cohorts that are getting the message back to what's being said. But the religious of the day would have viewed this man's deafness as a sign of sin, either in his life or in his parents' life. How sad that a person born deaf, ought to, well, you must have sin in your life. And you're nothing now. And you're an outcast. But whatever the case, whatever the reason for this man being deaf and unable to speak well, he has friends and family that cared enough to bring him. And, and, and that leads to that first little statement that's under point number one in your bullets in there. The best thing you can do for a hurting friend is bring them to Jesus. You, you, did you realize you don't have to fix them? Did you know you most of the time can't fix them? <laughs> and you'll, you'll kill yourself trying to fix them. But you can bring them to the one who can do something for them. And that's what these friends do. They bring their friend to Jesus and they lay him down. And it says they implored him. They begged him desperately. This reminds me of those four guys who picked up the bed of their friend and tried to get him to Jesus and they couldn't. So they climbed the roof, ripped the roof off and lowered him down. They couldn't do anything for the friend, but they could get him to Jesus, who, who could do something for him. So they didn't just drop the guy off. Listen here. They didn't just drop him off. They brought him, and then they go, Jesus, would you touch him? Would you put your hand on him? Would you heal him? Now let's step back for just a moment in the story. Aren't you thankful that Jesus is not like the religious leaders of this day, of, the, of his day? The religious leaders would have never interacted with these Gentile heathens. They would have never come around these disabled people who would have defiled them ceremonially, who would have made them unclean and unfit for the, the teaching and the leading of the people religiously. But Jesus gladly mingled with that crowd. He gladly got, himself, got his hands dirty in there. Extending his hand to those in need. Each of the events we've seen display Jesus' tremendous care and compassion for mankind. Each of these interactions demonstrate that he is not afraid of this ceremonial defilement. He's already told that it's not what goes in that defiles, but what comes out. These religious people wouldn't touch somebody infirm because they might get germs and might be nasty. Thankfully, we have a different example from our Savior. An example we're called to carry out in our lives. So, with that being said, a couple of questions for you. Who is it that cared enough about you to bring you to Jesus? And what I mean by that is, who cared enough about you that shared the message of salvation with you? Why did they do it for you? And before you think you deserved it, you didn't. Amen. What was the result of those friends, of that friend, of that loved one, of that coworker, of that Sunday school teacher, whoever it was, bringing you to Jesus, laying you there at his feet? What was the result? My prayer is it was salvation and eternal life. Amen. So then the next one, do you care enough? about those who are hurting around you to bring them to Jesus this week? I mean, you're living around a ton of them. Yeah. 
We see them all over the news right now. They're hurting. They have zero hope. They have no plan for eternity. Truly, as one wrote, this is their best life right now. Do we care enough? Do you care enough to carry that hurting person to the feet of Jesus? Well, let's move on in the story. These friends and family did. Verse 33 continues. Jesus took him aside from the crowd by himself. Jesus, listen, there's a little principle here. I've written it in there as well for you. It says, Jesus came to save the world, but he relates to each of us individually. Thankfully for that. Today, Jesus knows the need of each individual person in here. He is not slack in knowing what you need. He's not slack in knowing what, uh, understanding what your deepest need is right now. And he cares about you as an individual. He doesn't just look over and go, well, here's Baptist Church meeting, so I'll make sure they're safe and good to go for the day. He looks into each individual life, cares and he takes this guy in all of this crowd and all of the probably chaos. You imagine just people just being tossed down to Jesus' feet left and right. Jesus takes this guy and goes, come on, let's go over here for a bit. And takes him over by himself, individually, gives him his undivided attention. Can you imagine being that guy right now? You imagine he probably has the same attitude that the Syrophoenician woman had. Lord, have mercy on me. I don't deserve any of this treatment. I don't understand what's going on and I can't communicate it very well. And I can't hear a thing that's being said. Jesus takes him over. The creator is going to interact individually with creation. In a very intimate way, notice he does four things to try and communicate his care for this man. The first thing it says, he put his fingers in the man's ears. That seems odd. Jesus puts his fingers in the man's ears to communicate, I understand what the need is. You can't hear. You're not mentally handicapped. You're not mentally deficient. You're deaf. Therefore, you can't speak. I understand what your actual need is. While so many others have misdiagnosed it and, and, and kind of just passed it off as something else, I know. Second thing he does, he spits on the ground and then touches his tongue with the saliva. Now, real quick, there is no changing power in spit. Okay? Absolutely none. But in that day, there were many who believed that saliva had healing properties to it. Jesus touching the man's tongue with the saliva was another communication that I'm going to fix you. I'm going to heal your infirmity. Third thing, we find down into verse 34, Jesus looks up to heaven. <laughs> Why would Jesus look up to heaven? Because Jesus is now demonstrating where his power comes from. And even this pagan man would have understood what Jesus looking up to heaven meant. Jesus was now going to call upon God Almighty, the true God, creator and sustainer of all life. And fourth, this other communication. You might miss it if you just... Read through too quick. Looking up to heaven with a deep sigh. Jesus got his fingers in the guy's ears. He looks up to heaven. What's that all about? Think about it for a second. This deep sigh. Jesus is interacting with his creation, man. What did he create man for? Worship him and him alone. What got in the way of that entire thing? Sin. And through the curse of sin came deafness, blindness, cripple, lame, problems, hurts, and pains. As Jesus interacts with this man, he's right there face to face with the evidence, the effects of sin. And it pains our Savior. And he's heavy with sympathy for this man. Had this man 
we, we can draw conclusions. Had this man done anything to cause the deafness? Probably not. For him not to be able to speak well, it was probably born that way. He was probably born with it. And yet it, it comes about because the curse of sin so long ago passed down to mankind, on and on, down through even today. And it pained the Creator to see His creation in such a condition. And we find that third little statement under your point number one, that as a man, Jesus understands our pain. That's why we read Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 through 16 this morning. We read that one, two verses together. Again, chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Jesus knows your struggle. Jesus knows the hurt, and it pains him. He doesn't just sit there and go, well, if you just get it straight. He, it hurts him. He deeply sympathizes with his children, with those that he has saved, with creation that is lost. It pains him. God doesn't sit there with a smile on his face that people are going to die and go to hell. It pains him, yet it will happen. And as Jesus communicates to this man both God's power and his compassion on the man, he looks up to heaven with this deep sigh, and he says this word, Ephatha. And it means in English, be open. Be opened. <laughs> and I love what happens. Mark didn't use the word immediately here, but we could, we could interject that. Immediately the guy's ears opened, his speech impediment went away, and he spoke plainly. He began to speak clear. Immediately it says, the impediment, the impediment is, is a word like um, bondage chains. The bondage chains around his hearing and around his tongue were both broken and removed. And in an instant, the one who created, the one who sustains and upholds all the earth, enables this man to hear and speak plainly. Now, it does not say Jesus helped the guy hear and then brought a linguistic specialist over to teach him to talk. In an instant, the guy is speaking just like I am now. Maybe better than me. Hopefully better than me. Clearly. Plainly. Without any problems at all. Jesus never just takes it so far. He gives the whole thing. What an incredible picture of Jesus' healing, his care, and his compassion for mankind, even Gentiles. <laughs> and we find the fact that he does hear our cries by him interacting with these people whom socially and culturally he should have never talked to. Well, secondly, it brings us to point number two. That Jesus deserves our praise for all he does. So Jesus heals the guy. Can you imagine? He's over by himself. And now he brings him back over to the friends and the family members, potentially. Can you imagine that one? Walks up. Hey, guys, how's it going? <laughs> I, I, I just wish we could see that. Hey, Mom, how are you? Dad, I can hear you. Tell me you love me now. I can hear it now. I love you. <laughs> When's it going to rain again? I want to hear what thunder sounds like. I want to go hear the dog bark. I want to hear the cat meow. Potentially, I want to go see my brand new baby and I want to hear him or her cry. We don't know. We fill it all in ourselves, right? But nonetheless, the principle stands that Jesus deserves our praise for what he does. The man's ears are open. Verse 36 now. Jesus gives them, the man and his friends, family, those that have brought him, orders not to tell anyone. Now that doesn't make any sense. Because just earlier Jesus had told the demoniac man, go and tell everybody. Why would he say don't say anything now? 
Well, there's different circumstances. The demoniac had gone out and he had witnessed as he had been commanded to do. As I said, apparently he did a good job because there's a crowd here. But what's happened here has happened in other areas. The people are just there for the temporal fixes. Listen, we have to constantly remember, even in our day, Jesus doesn't come to fix the temporal things. Jesus comes first and foremost to fix the spiritual brokenness and need of a person's life. And so Jesus telling them, hey, don't say anything, it's because he doesn't doesn't want just that continued fueling of the fanfare for the temporal desires of healings and feedings. He wants to make sure people understand his point is the message of salvation for the soul. But as we find through the rest of this verse, as hopefully we would be and we still should be, the more he ordered them, the more widely they proclaimed it to everybody. Stop telling everybody, but we can't. We can't be quiet. We can't resist it. We can't hold back. Can you imagine a guy who hadn't been able to speak for however many years this was? You're going to tell him to be quiet now. Some of y'all have never had a problem hearing and speaking and you still won't be quiet. You just talk. It's great. This guy finally is loosed and free. There's no way you're going to shut him down. And they told everybody. And they told anybody. They told those that would listen, those that wouldn't listen. Yeah. Now you imagine he got home and he's like, hey, how's everybody doing today? Or maybe he got to work that next day. Hey, boss, what do you want me to do today? Whoa, what happened to you? Oh, uh, nothing. No, he's going to tell them. He's going to tell them all about it. And while Jesus commanded them not to speak, and it wasn't because he didn't want the message getting out, because he wanted the right focus. Listen, he has not given us that same command. He has not told us today in 2020 to be quiet about what Jesus has done in our lives. He's given us the exact opposite command. Matthew 28, 20, go and tell everybody. Tell them all. Proclaim the message to the world around you. Now listen, I I truly believe that last little statement that's under point number two there. When Jesus has touched us, we can't resist telling others. You can't help it. Even if somebody put a muzzle on you, you'd find another way to do it. Think about the Apostle Paul. They tried with him, put him in prison. What'd he do? He won half the Praetorian guards to Christ. He won won the, the prisoners to Christ. You see, over and over through history where people have been told to silence and quiet and don't talk about it, but they're compelled by what Christ has done in their life, they can't hold it back. They have to, no matter what's going to come. Imprisonment, beatings, death, they can't resist telling others again an opportunity for us to search our hearts. Have we been touched by Jesus? Has our life been changed? And if so, are you telling others about him? Do you tell them? It's our job. It's our responsibility. So verse 37 sums it all up. Here this guy goes around telling all the friends and family, co-workers, neighbors, and says they are utterly astonished. Remember Matthew's word? Marveled. They are awestruck at what has taken place in this man's life. They are floored that Jesus has been able to do what none of their pagan gods, none of their doctors, none of their holistic anythings could do. And they begin to say, he, Jesus, has done all things well. He's done all things. He didn't just give this guy 20% hearing. He gave him 100% hearing. He didn't just help him start to form words. He gave him perfect speech. (laughs) This man talks and and acts like he's never had a problem. That's exactly the point. Now, as we draw this to a conclusion, I want to, I want to draw another parallel point from Isaiah chapter 35. 
When Mark describes the man in verse 32 as being uh, uh, speaking with difficulty, in the Greek, there's, there's a Greek word used there. I won't give you all those details. <laughs> that same word occurs in Isaiah 35. It, the, the Greek word's only used one time here in verse 32 in all of the New Testament. And the same form of this word in Hebrew is used in Isaiah 35. So I want to I just give you a little paraphrasing of Isaiah 35. By the way, write it in there to read over that this week. It's an incredible description of the beauty of the future millennial kingdom when Christ returns. But the first few verses paraphrase out kind of like this. The deserts will bloom with beautiful flowers. The nations will see the glory of the Lord. The weak will be strengthened. God's enemies will be judged and the righteous will be saved. And then verse 5 picks up this word that Mark has used. It says, then the eyes of the blind will be open. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue, here it is, of the mute will shout for joy. The healing that Jesus performed here in Mark's gospel is a preview of his future kingdom to come. It's a picture that not only will the Jews be a part of that kingdom, but the Gentiles as well. That's a glorious statement for all of us here today. Yeah. Now let me just carry out a little further in Isaiah chapter 35, verses 8 through 10. Here's what it goes on to give us a greater picture of what's to come. And maybe it would get us a little bit excited about it. A highway will be there, a roadway. And it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way. And fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there. But the redeemed will walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion, with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Our Savior won't go any longer. We won't go any longer. It'll flee away. What an incredible picture of what's to come for all who have trusted Christ as Savior and Lord. For all who have come at His feet and asked to be saved. In this story, we found great care and compassion of our Savior. And so I'd ask you, in closing, a few questions there at the bottom of your page. I asked this one earlier, now it's written down for you to consider. Have you been changed by Jesus? I mean, have you trusted Christ as Savior and Lord? If not, would you call on Him today. If you have trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, then these next ones, these next questions apply to you. Do you care enough to bring the hurting to Jesus? Do you care enough to tell others about him? Listen, there may be a need for you to repent of not sharing the gospel today. There may be sin in your life that keeps you from caring for others. Anger, pride, jealousy, materialism, coveting, all, a host of other sins. Those things make it all me-oriented. Yeah. I don't care about you at that point. It's all about me. And there's a need for some potentially to get their heart right first today. Before you go into question number four, who's God placing in your path this week to share your story in the gospel with? Jesus does not give believers today the command, go away and be quiet. He gives the command, go and tell everyone. Amen. So who's God going to put in your path this week to share your story, to share the gospel with this week? Do you know one of the greatest ways you can share the testimony is by sharing your story? Yep. And that, does, that does better than just going through the Romans road. You just share your story of before Christ, but God, and after Christ. And then please, please, please live that story out. Yes. 
Don't speak that story and live some way, some other direction. Live that story out. We're going to stand in just a moment. But before we do, before I pray and we begin to sing our invitation song, it's a different song this morning, one that we probably have not sung in here before. It's a song by Charles Wesley, and it, was, it struck him to write this song after hearing a fellow brother in Christ make this statement. If I had a thousand tongues, I would praise Christ with them all. I hope that would be our prayer and our statement as well. That with every breath, every word we have, we seek to praise God with it. To honor Christ. And so as we see this incredible picture of this man being healed, the preview it gives us that it wasn't just for the, Jew, the Jews, but the Gentiles as well. As we see this incredible connection even into the millennial kingdom to come. And the joy that that has for all of us who are in Christ. Until that day comes. May we spend our lives proclaiming him, his care and compassion for lost mankind and providing the hope that only Jesus can give them. I pray we will go out this week and care enough to bring people to him and then let him do what only he can do. But maybe you need that first this morning. Maybe you need to get your heart right about some things, whatever it is. As we stand now together, as we prepare to sing this incredible old hymn song, Thousand Tongues, consider our heart, consider our lives, and allow the Spirit to work in these closing moments together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the time we've had to study your word, for the time we've had to consider the care and compassion of our Savior. Father, I'm so thankful that ages and ages ago you saw fit to set a plan of redemption in motion that would, that would take your own son giving up his life. And Father, I'm thankful for many in this room who have trusted Christ as their Savior and Lord. And Father, I pray for those who haven't done that yet. Maybe those that don't even understand their need this morning. I pray, Father, that in these closing moments, your spirit would move and awaken their heart to understand their need of a Savior. And that today they would come before you and receive that eternal life. Father, I pray for the needs across this room. The hurts and the pains, the difficulties of life. We're thankful that you know each one of them. We're thankful that you're working in each and every one. Father, give grace and comfort in these days. Father, if there's anyone here that's in sin, I pray that today they would repent of that sin and receive that forgiveness that can only come from you. And Father, in these moments, you would move mightily. We ask it in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen. have a 
It's a great song, isn't it? It's an incredible song. And we only sang four out of the original 18 verses. So, you're welcome. I pray that you have a wonderful afternoon. Look forward to our time again together this evening, 5 o'clock. Getting used to saying that now, 5 o'clock this evening. And also remember that in just a couple more weeks, Sunday school and Wednesday nights kick in. Awana kicks back in, and so we're excited about all of that. Thankful for that. It's been great to have Taffy with us today. We miss Buddy not being here, but he is getting a little stronger each day. We're thankful. Continue praying for his recovery. And as that uh, time continues to roll forward for their departure to Ecuador, just pray for those steps that all have to be in place. And we know the Lord will order them all. Pray for one another. Have a great afternoon. Visitors, it was great to have you. And we'll see you this evening.